John, I saw you were taking notes during Ari's presentation. Do you have a question for Ari? Um, how unpleasant is it to deal with the taxi owners? <laughs> Not unpleasant at all. Uh, <laughs> um, I think that uh, they've actually been a, a great part of this process. Um, Given that they sue, they've been suing the city every so often for any kind of regulation for more fuel efficient taxes. Um, I think that um, you know, right? I think that if we can make the, if we can make electric cars um, make sense for them, either as um, a way to appeal to drivers um, or economically because of reduced maintenance costs, um, they they are supportive. Um, they will be supportive. But. That's probably one thing to add about electric cars. If you have a battery electric car, the only thing that it needs is tires and wiper blades. It, it uses brake pads, but very, very little compared to a regular car. And there are no tune-ups at all. No belts and plugs and all that other stuff. So electric cars, another part of the ownership equation is actually that they're incredibly cheap to maintain as well. OK, thank you. OK. Um, Owen had a question, and, and, and Martha Cameron also has the same question. Okay. Would it be possible to have batteries that could be swapped out? So battery A is charging at home while battery B is being used. Um, yes. And in fact, there is a company called Better Place uh, that is piloting this concept in Israel now. Um, they have a network of what are called swap stations. You don't swap it out at home. You take your car home and recharge it overnight. But if you want to travel further than the car's range, they have set up something like 36 swap stations. You drive your car in, it goes up on a lift, they yank out the battery, put in a fully charged battery, and you go on your way. It takes about as long as a car wash. Um, there are a couple of challenges with this problem. Unlike the batteries, the AAA batteries that we all use. The batteries for electric cars are not standardized. Um, they use different cells from different makers. And the battery of an electric car is a structural piece of the car. So it weighs somewhere between 300 and 900 pounds. You have to build it into the car's frame. And so designing a car where you can yank it out is a complex thing. And it only really works if there are standardized batteries. Everybody in the world knows what a AAA is, and you can buy a AAA anywhere, right? That is not the case with batteries. The car makers say just as engines are not standardized, we make an engine, they make an engine, they're not interchangeable. The batteries they consider to be their intellectual property, and they don't see an advantage to offering generic battery packs that are the same from car from one manufacturer's car to the other. So the guessing in the industry is that the better place experiment only really works in limited places. Israel is effectively an island. Hawaii is an island. That's another place where it could work. But in places like the US, where you would need those same 15,000 swap stations, unlikely. OK, great. Um, this is an interesting question. Um, it's for you, okay. Ari. Um, Electric cars don't make a lot of noise. No. Could this be dangerous? I mean, are, will New Yorkers get hit by cars if we don't hear them coming? Um, it's, a, it, it, it's, a, it's a very valid question. Um, it's funny how even being a quieter city can have a, uh, can have a negative consequence. Um, the federal government is actually working on a standard for noise um, in electric cars. So um, I think, you know, so hopefully what will result from that is a car that is both more pleasant but also um, still audible, so I don't get hit on my bicycle. Okay. Great. Uh, I, I have a question um, with these charging stations. Yep. Maybe you address this, and I'm sorry if I didn't hear the answer. What will the cost be? I oh. mean, will I pay for that? I bring my car to a garage. I, I didn't address that well, so thank you for asking me. Um, there are several models that are um, that um, garages that are offering. So some are offering it as an amenity because, as you know, it's pretty expensive to park in a garage, um, and that you know, um, compared to that, the cost of electricity is um, is negligible. So um, so some garages are offering it amenities. 
as an amenity. Other garages, um, uh, either by themselves or through third-party charge, uh, that charge can be is often. Oh, yeah. So um, here's a here's a card from John on um, on how you would uh, pay for a uh, for a charger that charges. Um, and uh, so some of the models in those garages are either um, per charge, um, a, a can be a few bucks, or a $99, um, all you can charge over the course of a month. Um, what we're trying to do is make it as easy for, um, for as many options um, as possible to happen. So uh, we've changed regulations in the city. Thank you, I don't want to use your electricity. Um, mm -hmm. We've changed regulations in the city. Um, so that, um, so that garages can charge by the kilowatt hour, which again sounds like arcane, but basically what it means is that you know, somebody who comes in with a plug-in Prius won't get hosed and pay as much as a, uh, as a Tesla owner will uh, for their electricity. So, um, so the short answer is there are lots of garages that are offering it in many different ways, and if you're interested, you can definitely shop around and get the best deal possible. Just to expand on that a little bit, there are a number of networks right now, ChargePoint is one, that you join uh, and get a card and then you go to their, uh, their network of charging stations, which is inconvenient because the map of points that Ari put up has all the networks. So they are starting to combine and allow what is effectively roaming. And the thought is that ultimately you will be able to pay at any charging station by roaming across networks and ideally not carry a separate card, but just do it with your mobile phone. There will be an app for that, is what he's trying to say. <laughs> like everything else, right? Okay. Good answers. Um, John, you were talking about the crib countries. Um, that's a huge, that's going to be all, all the new cars. So what do you think is the destiny there? What's, is it going to go electric or is it going to go gas fuel? For the moment, the answer is gas. However, um, compared to the US and Europe, which never did not until recent decades have any regulations on emissions or fuel economy, um, China and other developing markets do have fairly stringent fuel economy standards. So it's better than it might have been. Um, China had as part of its government industrial policy that they wanted to dominate the global electric car business. They make oh, well over half of all of the lithium, lithium ion cells consumed in the world. So they thought, okay, that's easy. We're developing a car industry. We make batteries, done deal. It's a little more complicated than that. Um, and what they found is they don't have a domestic market. Chinese car buyers are extremely, extremely price sensitive. And they simply do not see any advantage to electric cars Plus, the bulk of Chinese people, even those who are affluent enough to own cars, live in multiple dwellings. And you have the problems of not having charging stations easily available. However, um, again, when you look at the cost curves 10, 15 years out, the price of batteries falls 7% a year. The price of gasoline cars to meet stringent <coughs> fuel economy standards goes up. There is a point where the lines get close enough where all of a sudden, the mass markets, first here because we're more affluent, but even in developing countries, start to realize that an electric car <coughs> is going to be a cheaper way to transport themselves around. Not this year, not next year, but sometime after 2020. And the growth in a place like China and India is still in its early stages. There's a statistic like 18 out of every thousand Chinese people has a car right now. There's a lot of headway left, and it's not all going to happen next year. But China is already the largest car market in the world. They buy more cars than we do here in North America, and it is expected by 2020 they will buy twice as many cars a year as we do. Okay. Great. Um, this question is Angie Miller, and her organization is Center for Environmental Health. How feasible is it for truck vehicle fleets to move to electric? It's a good question. Um, it's the the target market for trucks is probably not going to be the big heavy trucks. So, for example, a garbage truck, um, it will be challenging um, to make that all electric, um, or a big um, tractor trailer. Uh, but medium duty trucks, which are the ones that you see, it was that that Dwayne Reed truck was actually a big example of it. Um, you know, the ones that are um, 
you know, that FedEx drives, UPS, um, you know, even the neighborhood florist. Um, all those trucks are actually pretty good candidates um, for several reasons. One is um, there are vehicles being made. Um, the, the, unfortunately, the market's actually shrunk a little bit, um, but Smith Electric uh, announced that they were building a facility in the, the Bronx and they build a uh, medium duty truck that, um, you know, that can serve that market. So, so there are vehicles available, that's one. And then two, um, you know, uh, commercial, um, commercial drivers or, or companies are more willing to accept an economic payback in year five and year six that, um, that John alluded to. And then finally, the way they drive actually lends itself pretty well to an electric car, which is to say they mostly know their routes. Um, so that being said, there are all these reasons why we should be really bullish on um, electric trucks in the city. Um, and in fact, uh, companies that have them, um, so FedEx is running 10, um, they're happy with those. Um, uh, Dwayne Reed's electrified a quarter of its fleet. DHL runs 70 electric trucks. I think all of its uh, Manhattan fleet is either um, uh, pure electrics or hybrids. Um, you know, all those companies are pretty happy, but you know, we haven't seen the adoption we'd like. So um, I think it's a good market and, uh, you know, and I'm optimistic. I would add maybe that the characteristics of the trucks that are best for electrification, less than 50 total miles a day and back to base at night. All those FedEx trucks go back to one place, the same place every night so you can recharge it. Great. Um, are there laws that you're actually, I mean, is this any of this that stuff that you're doing going into a law or anything in, in the city or are there any, um, and then maybe you can answer that one, and then John can answer, are there any sort of federal laws that are being passed about these vehicles? Uh, well, we hope that the, um, the parking, the 20% uh, of new parking spots be built electric car ready. Uh, we hope to make that a law. Um, the, there were some other ones like, um, you know, so for example, we're trying to, we're, uh, you know, we set a goal of electrifying a third of the taxi fleet. Um, you know, the mayor a few years ago had, um, had uh, required that all taxis be hybrid. Um, and unfortunately, um, the Second Circuit um, um, issued a decision that was upheld by the Supreme Court of the United States that said that the city can't, in fact, do that. Um, so, because it would be a preemption of the Clean Air Act. Um, so, you know, there's some, it's, so, that, so that's why um, not all of our cabs on the road today are hybrid. Um, so, uh, so, so the green, so the, the new parking is is a law, but the rest we think we can do by, um, but through education and outreach and awareness. Okay, great. Uh, on a federal level, there are a new set of uh, gas mileage laws that went into effect uh, from 2012 through 2017, and then 2018 through 2025, which sounds like a long way away. But car makers really want to know what's coming way down the pike, so they can make their billion dollar investments in the right ways. Um, those gas mileage regulations will be very hard to meet with the current mix of vehicles. So all of the makers will make at least some electric cars because they're weighted in a way where they help the makers achieve gas mileage even if they don't use gas. Their California actually has some of the most aggressive legislation. California has always had the right to set its own air pollution laws because it was doing so before the EPA even existed. Um, California Air Resources Board is a very, very powerful entity. They are already requiring zero emission vehicle, a certain number of zero emission vehicles to be sold uh, in California starting this year, um, which has led to the rise of what we call compliance cars. There's a group of electric cars out there that are only sold in California. They're made by major makers. They're, Chevrolet makes them, uh, Ford makes them, uh, Toyota makes them, uh, Honda makes them. They're great electric cars. They will sell exactly as many of them as it takes to tick the box and not be penalized, not a single one more. And some of them are even taking them back after the three years and destroying them because that will allow them to meet the regulations. On the other hand, it gets six car makers that did not make electric cars into the business. Last point, federal government actually uses incentives. Um, if you buy a battery electric vehicle, you qualify for an income tax credit of $2,500 to $7,500, knocked right off your liability. Um, the Prius plug-in is the lowest level, the Volt and anything above that is the highest level, and there are some plug-in hybrids in the middle. But 
you won't get a check in the mail. Your tax liability goes down up to 15 months later. California and some other states actually send you a check in the mail. If you buy an electric car in California, you get the $7,500 off. California sends you a check for $2,500 in the mail, and you get to travel solo in the carpool lane, which was one of the single <laughs> biggest incentives that any government has ever offered wow. for electric cars. All right, now we're gonna segue a little bit into, you know, maybe there's some problems with electric cars. Um, we've been talking about, you know, how great everything is. So let's talk a little bit about the other side. I'm sure we all have a lot of questions here. A couple people have asked questions about the batteries and um, are they dangerous and what are the environmental problems with the, the batteries themselves? Okay. Um, Good, very good questions. With one exception, no electric car uses the same battery chemistry as are used in your phones or laptops. When we say lithium ion cells, that's actually a family of different chemistries. Some of them are more likely to uh, self-oxidize, explode, than <laughs> others. No electric car except for the first 2,500 Tesla Roadsters, <coughs> uses the chemistry that's used in cell phone batteries. If anyone's seen the videos of flaming laptops, okay, every one in five million cells or so does have a tendency to light itself off of that chemistry. Those are not used because quite frankly, everybody who makes electric cars knows that the first time that an affluent telegenic family gets barbecued in an electric car is the end of the industry. I'm serious. We have 25,000, sorry? Can you just speak up a little bit, please? Oh, sorry. Um, <coughs> the, uh, the, the money line was the first time an affluent, good-looking, telegenic family gets barbecued in an electric car is the end of the industry. We have 25,000 gasoline car fires a year. Or is it 125,000? It's some very large number that we have completely normalized. Gasoline is actually much more dangerous, but we accept that as a price of getting around. Um, so there are a lot of safeguards built into electric car batteries. Uh, see me later. Um, I have not yet seen good data on the environmental impacts of the mining for the substances in those batteries. Um, the batteries and, to a greater extent, the electric motors and the electronics do have some rare earth metals in them, um, but lithium is actually found all over the globe. And at the moment, the bulk of the lithium that we use is sitting on a large plain in Peru. And you just sort of scrape it off the ground and refine it. Lithium is also recyclable. These batteries, when their lifespan is over, and they'll have a secondary life after the electric car, they'll get recycled. The batteries will get recycled because they have value. They do not get dumped over a cliff. Most people don't know, lead-acid car batteries today are the single most recycled consumer good in the world. Something like 98% of all lead-acid car batteries now are recycled, in part because lead is a really horrible substance that is very dangerous to humans. But lithium-ion car batteries similarly will be recycled as the batteries from the hybrids are now. So the batteries will be recycled. I don't have a lot of good data yet, and I'm looking for it on the environmental impacts of the mining, but the bulk of the carbon profile of any vehicle is not the manufacturing and the materials that go into it, but the fuel used over a 10 or 15 year life to move it around. So e electric cars probably have a higher carbon profile than a regular car, but still that is outweighed by their savings in carbon over their lifespan. Does that? Yeah. It's nice to be on a panel with John. <laughs> I can talk like this for hours. <laughs> sorry. No, no, I'm no. sorry. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask a question that may you may not be able to answer because it's it's not necessarily about electric cars. Um, I watched the movie Who Killed the Electric Car a couple years ago, and one of the things that killed the electric car was the oil and gas industry, and. Um, you know, when you're doing your presentation, I, I'm really wanting to know, you know, what is the, you may not be able to answer this, 
but you might have heard things. What is, I mean, what is the oil and gas industry's reaction to this new surge, the revenge of the electric car? And in, in the revenge of the electric car movie didn't address that. Um, you know, um, what are they going to do to, are, do they want to stop this? This, this <coughs> dream of electric cars? I think that's your question. No, no, that's uh, not <laughs> It may not be anyone's okay. question. So, I have a brother who works in the oil and gas industry and has his whole career. There are certain topics that we do not discuss in family dinners. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm going to lead into this with an anecdote. I asked him about this notion of peak oil. Um, I've read the book. I've seen some arguments for and against peak oil. His response to, is peak oil correct, was interesting. He said, look, this is a large, dirty, powerful, high dollar, global industry. I'm interpolating a little bit. Um, he said, we will find you all of the oil and gas that you need under the most optimistic demand scenario anyone has put together for the next 50 years at a minimum. All you have to do is tell us how much you're willing to pay for it and how much environmental degradation you can tolerate. That's how the oil and gas industry looks at the world. Gasoline is a part of what they do um, and vehicle fuels are a part of what they do. It is not by a large extent, all of what they do. And the numbers on electric cars, even under our most optimistic scenario, are that um, it will be a minimal impact on oil companies for the next several decades. And I am quite sure that we will always have gasoline and diesel vehicles with us in some respect through the next century whether they remain as only 10% of that fleet of 2 billion or 3 billion cars at the end of the century or not is TBD. It tends to be dangerous in technology to project even for heavy technologies like cars and oil beyond 20 years or thereabouts. Um, I don't think the oil industry cares right now. They have bigger and uglier problems than electric cars and I think that will apply for the next 10 or 15 years. So no, I don't think the oil industry is trying to kill electric cars. I think they don't care. My take. Hmm. But I'm open to counter arguments, seriously. I'd like to see your uh, hand raised because I'm just so curious. Who, who here thinks that the oil and gas industry is threatened by electric cars? Okay. And who here thinks that the oil and gas industry has bigger fish to fry. Okay. Interesting. Is it one or the other? Yeah. Yeah. So I actually want to play devil's advocate with that. Um, if, if the uh, oil and gas industry was so bent out of shape by this in the you know, mid to late 90s, why would they for it now? You know, that doesn't make any sense to me. I'm not going to critique who killed the electric car in detail because the folks who made it are friends and colleagues of mine. I, living in the, oil, in the auto industry, um, I think I see the world slightly differently than they do. So I don't necessarily tend to think that it is quite as clear cut as was presented in that movie. I would love to see, well, that's a different discussion. <laughs> The next question, I'm just gonna just pick a random question. This one. <laughs> okay, well, I'm just gonna go with it. <laughs> Beverly Burks asks, are you planning to fuel the New York grid with fracked gas? All yours. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I work on electric cars. Um, not um, not electricity generation. So um, so I'm I'm not your guy to, to answer that question. Um, but I think that you know I'm sure this audience does have questions about how electric cars <coughs> and natural gas um, relate. Um, 
So first, you know, I think what we probably will have to agree to disagree on the short term about the, um, you know, the costs and benefits of, of uh, natural gas uh, for electricity generation and, you know, what we can replace it with in the short term. But what I would say is, is two part. One is um, even if we got electric vehicle uh, penetration, you know, equal to hybrids, you know, uh, tomorrow, um, it's still less than one tenth of one percent of our overall generation. So, um, so that's that's one one aspect of how electric cars and uh, natural gas relate. The other is that I think in many ways electric cars are a complement to a lot of the renewables um, that we're all supportive of, um, and I think that's two parts. One is um, electric vehicles sort of naturally will charge overnight, uh, which is a good opportunity to soak up um, um, renewable power, specifically wind that's often blowing at a time when um, demand is otherwise not around. And then the second is uh, what John also alluded to with batteries. Um, electric cars will help drive down the cost of batteries, both new batteries and then also batteries that were in a vehicle and then are being pulled out. Um, and then those batteries are also a nice complement to renewable power, both wind and solar, because uh, they can store energy and help smooth out that intermittency issue. And then also there's some potential for using the vehicles, um, both vehicle to grid, vehicle, um, you know, both um, as batteries themselves. Um, although I think that that, um, although though New York looked at that and we weren't able to do that in the short term. So um, for those reasons, um, and then just to give you an example of how that's actually working, um, Tesla already today um, couples um, battery packs that, you know, um, battery packs that, that are similar to the ones it makes with its vehicles with its quick chargers. So, um, you know, that's not high in the sky, it's happening now. So that's sort of how I see um, electric vehicles fitting into this, this world of uh, natural gas in New York. And I, I can sort of add two examples to that. Uh, the lithium ion cells that go into cars offer the promise of giving electric utilities something they do not now have the capability of doing, which is storing energy that they generate. Right now, largely, the only practical way to store energy is behind dams. And it's very hard to get permits to build dams these days, or pump storage, I think it's sometimes called. But there are experiments now going on, uh, again, in California that I'm familiar with. I actually know less about New York Power. But um, a couple of California utilities who have large uh, renewable installations, both wind and solar, which tend to be out in unpopulated areas away from the grid, so they have to build new grid to get that power in, are looking at building climate controlled bunkers filled full of the same lithium ion batteries that go into electric cars. They can control the conditions under which those batteries are used, but I am given to understand that once you get above some number like 13 or 14 percent renewables in your grid mix, you end up imperiling the stability of the grid because renewables are peaky. The sun goes behind clouds, wind comes in bursts, etc. What, what lithium ion batteries do is complement renewables, let you buffer that energy and pull it back out at times of peak demand so you don't have to turn on the dirtiest generators to meet peak demand. So that's the big scale example. Small scale example is this. I talked about the fact that electric car batteries will have a life after cars. We all know batteries lose capacity over time, right? Your phone battery is not as good now as it was when you bought it. Same thing happens to electric car batteries. But the, a car battery is considered essentially at the end of its life, after say 10 years, once it's at about 80% of its original capacity. That still gives you an expensive battery pack with substantial numbers of kilowatt hours of electricity in it that has a secondary life. And one of the guys at Southern California Edison said to me, look, it costs about $25,000 in photovoltaics right now to put your house in so you can do reverse metering and feed back into the grid, right? Um, what'd you pay for your photovoltaics that are powering your car? I have a big array that powers my whole house and my car, and mine costs about $40,000. Okay, great. So we're talking big money. Even with some of the financing plans, that's tough. Suppose you could take that $25,000, cut it down to $10,000, tie it to a used electric car battery pack for another three or $5,000. Not only can your house generate energy, it can store that energy, and the electric utility can say two things. Number one, okay, I'd really like to buy some of that stored energy from you at peak demand. 
Or number two, oh, it's peak demand. Oh, you know what? Your house has 10 kilowatt hours of electricity. That'll run you for four hours. I will pay you to knock you off the grid for four hours in peak demand. Your house will power itself on your solar power, and I'll pay you for that. There are, there are a number of uses for electric car batteries after the car, and that will become its whole ecosystem. We don't know right now, because there aren't a lot of used batteries out there now, but there is a lot of interest in secondary usage. And I was talking to Tom before, and I, he said that, I think he said that just in his gas savings alone, he doesn't spend $6,000 a year of what most people spend in gas. So it won't take that many years for, to pay off that $40,000. I mean, and that's not even, obviously he um, saves on his home electric bills as well. So sounding, Sounded good to me. I wish I had those solar panels <laughs> myself. Okay. And really quickly, I know you, you mentioned the grid and how it, um, that's a myth, you know, but I, I still feel like I want to ask in New York City, during the summer, everyone's running their air conditioning, what, what will happen? Yep. Um, so Con Ed um, did an analysis um, with us back in 2010, and they said that, that we could accommodate, um, you know, I, I don't actually remember the percentage anymore, but it was, it was close to a fifth um, of vehicles being electric if you do smart charging. And I think what that means is, um, you know, really pushing vehicles to charge overnight. Because So John mentioned that uh, there are peaks and troughs. Um, you know, we, um, and I heard from Con Ed recently, that um, we build uh, the bulk of our electrical capacity for about eight hours a day. You know, so eight hours a year, eight hours a year. Um, we have a system that's built to handle um, the load on the eight hottest, sunniest days of the year. Um, so that what that means is that there's just a tremendous amount of excess capacity. Um, you you have to encourage you know you, you have to encourage people by and large to use it um, off peak. But um, but the way the rates are you know but it's cheaper for people to do that and it lends to the way people use cars anyway. So it, it, it should be a good fit. So I'm hearing that New York City has excess of. Power. I mean, we don't need to build out more power plants and maybe bring in this. You're, is that correct? Well, no, I'm saying capacity. So basically the wiring, um, you know, the, tr the transmission and distribution system, um, you know, apart from the, the generation that's um, for electricity um, is, um, you know, there's, there's extra capacity sort of on these off-peak hours okay. for electricity use. Understood. Okay. I'm going to take another question, and I'm just going to pick one. It's like a magic trick. OK. I've already asked this one. <laughs> ask that one again. Um, OK. Suzanne Clare. I've heard that Cambridge Crude might have the potential to make it impossible to swap out spent battery fluid for fresh. Any thoughts on that? Okay. Make it impossible. Possible. Make it possible. <laughs> Sorry. I, if, and this, I wrote this story a while back, so forgive my foggy memory. I believe you're talking about the pumpable electrolyte in batteries. Yeah. Um, I don't know too much about that at the moment. It is very much a. Um, a lab research project at the moment. Um, so I'm not sure I have a lot useful to say on it, aside from I would anticipate that that would not be seen in commercial products for at least a decade. Sorry. But we hope it does. <laughs> One of the things, it's, it's largely about physics. Um, Sometimes when I give a piece of this lecture, I'll walk in carrying, you know, imagine a plastic gallon bottle of water, right? So I walk in and I have a bottle of pink liquid. It's a gallon. And you can always shock the crowd by saying, this is a gallon of gasoline, because everyone goes like this. Um, if you think about a gallon of gasoline, which weighs about seven pounds, that is enough energy to move something 25 miles that weighs two tons, okay? 
That will move a two-ton vehicle 25 miles. That's a hell of a lot of energy in a very, very small amount of weight. The physics of batteries are not even a tenth as good, which is why we don't have batteries that will run us a thousand miles. Um, it's, it's about the physics of energy storage. Batteries are getting better. Sadly, or hydrocarbons, hydrocarbon chains are an extremely good way to store a lot of energy, which is why they're always, why I believe gasoline and diesel fuel will always be with us in some ways through the end of my lifetime. Interesting. Um, and did you talk about compressed natural gas in in your? I know we talked. To, you, we I want to touch upon like all, all other alternative fuels, biodiesel, um, and, and I'm still confused on what's what. Um, I mean, I know you mentioned that it's it's um, difficult to build out that infrastructure. And so it just makes sense to go with electric. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, do you guys have a point of view on CNG for the um, You know, I think that there's uh, sort of some applications where um, um, where CNG makes makes sense, but um, you know, where, where we basically support fuels that are um, reduced carbon and uh, air quality impacts. Okay. Um, there is some thought that there is a role for compressed natural gas in vehicles. Um, I talked before about the infrastructural problems. So that role is probably limited to fleets which can fuel their vehicles centrally as opposed to individuals who live all over the place and want to fuel wherever they go. Um, there is now one vehicle, passenger vehicle, sold uh, that runs on natural gas. It's the Honda Civic natural gas. It's built in Ohio. They sell two or three thousand of them a year, largely to commercial fleets. Um, and they are expanding its sale. And all of the folks who, uh, GM, Ford, and Chrysler, who make big pickup trucks, are starting to offer bi fuel trucks, which is to say trucks that can run either on gasoline or diesel or compressed natural gas. Um, globally, CNG is actually biggest in India um, for reasons I forget, but it is a substantial piece of the market. Also in Iran, interestingly enough, um, Iran has a very developed CNG auto industry. We don't see them here, obviously. Um, and there are a couple of other places, including Brazil. Um, but again, you have to put hundreds of millions or billions of dollars into permitting and siting a different fueling infrastructure than you have right now. And the gas stations, for obvious reasons, have absolutely no interest in allowing you to put it in a place that already lets you fuel. So I, there, there is some thought that maybe CNG in the long run becomes the fuel for semis. If we say that diesel just turns out to be a really bad fuel in the long run, in terms of energy density, what are the alternatives? Maybe you start to run your highway semis so you, then you just put CNG stations at, at interstate rest stops. TBD, don't know. And have you driven in a French fry car? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I have ridden in one. I haven't driven one. So biodiesel, three, yeah. three minutes. I really can go on like this online. Um, <laughs> so one of the problems with saying the word biodiesel is it means really different things to different people. To a lot of people, it means the guy who has a 1980s Mercedes Benz who did a deal with his local Chinese uh, wok store to take all of their used cooking oil away. He filters it, he drops it in his tank, and he runs his diesel car on cooking oil. That's great. Um, it's, I love recycling. Um, it is not, however, how modern diesel cars run. If you do that to a modern diesel car, it won't run, and they won't honor your warranty. Modern diesels have evolved a great deal. There is something also known as biodiesel that to the fuels geeks of the world, some of whom I know, um, there is a very specific fuels specification for sustainable diesel fuel that comes out of grown oils. Um, interesting company called Solazyme in California that actually has created algae that are 75% this custom tailored oil that they can make into 
biodiesel or jet fuel or skincare products. <laughs> Seriously, they have a skincare product line. I love startups. Um, biodiesel to these folks is something much more specific. We may start to see biodiesel blended into the diesel fueling mix once the car makers assure themselves that their cars will run properly, which requires a lot of testing. Right now, if you own, anybody here own a diesel car? Aha, what? What is it? A Ford truck. Okay. Um, the, what year? 2004. Okay. Don't know, read your owner's manual. <laughs> it may allow you to use up to B20. B100. B100, yeah, seriously? Stay one. No kidding, okay. That's a, that's a bit of an anomaly. Most truck makers are, are at B20, I think. But, all right, so he can run on completely biodiesel. Get a ride with him. Well, um, technically not supposed to. Ah, but will they honor your warranty if you do? Technicality, it's uh, fuel meets the ASEM standards, so they have to. But we'll have a fuel geek sidebar later. But most trucks will run on up to 20% biodiesel. Most cars are still at 5%. They are going to move cars to 20% biodiesel, which is that specific fuel. There is actually probably more opportunity there in the short term than there is for ethanol, which is a gigantic political nightmare on, with many different facets I'm not going to get into. I want to give a shout out though to Carl Vogel who answered that question, who's the um, co-chair of the Electric Auto Association New York chapter, so um, he's committed. <laughs> uh, we have time for one more question and then we're going to do our raffles and I'll let Ari, you pick the question. <laughs> Okay. Um, Marianna Spector, don't hybrids charge their own batteries? With improved technology, might they use a very small amount of gasoline? Um, see, I feel like if you had asked, um, you know, where can I charge my car on 125th Street, I could have answered your question, but I guess <laughs> this is a good one. So, um, yes, hybrids indeed um, charge their own batteries, and uh, one of the questions is, as battery prices come down, will hybrids get bigger batteries so they can travel more electrically? The problem with a hybrid, though, it is much more efficient than a gasoline car. But still, when you burn gasoline in an engine, only 25% of the energy content of that gasoline actually turns into motions at the wheel, which similarly, only 25% of the gasoline engine in the hybrid, that energy is going to uh, sort of move the car. So you are still limited by the fact that you have a gasoline engine. Hybrid, right now the Prius is rated at 50 miles a gallon, highest fuel economy car sold in the country. The next one maybe kind of could get to maybe kind of 60. Getting above that is really tough without a plug. Electric cars on the other hand, um, from the energy coming out of your socket, about 90 or 92 percent of it makes it into your battery pack, and about 80 to 90 percent of that makes it to your wheels. Electric cars are far more efficient with the raw energy than are any form of combustion engine cars. It's just that hydrocarbons have so much energy in them, you can waste a ton of it, and you still get better. Thank you guys so much. John Volker, Ari Khan. Thank you.